one. I am so excited to be here. This is so great. This is a really fun, regular schedule. We've started to get ourselves on here with some really great guests. It's been incredibly, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one little get lich there. It's been so fun. So happy to be here. But I'm really thrilled to be back in Santa Barbara. We had a blast at our last live event with Kelly Knickerbocker in her Seattle studio. And if you haven't had a chance to check out that chat, it's a good time. So go there. So if you're new to our YouTube live events, this is our opportunity to connect with you, a member of our community. Both Mosaic Arts Online and Create Arts Online are our two online schools. Well, you know, sometimes you can feel like an island out there, you know, creating and learning on your own. And we see that you guys are making amazing stuff, but sometimes you want to feel a little bit more of a connection. So that's what today is all about and all of our live events that we get to really connect with people with you and some new um, and exciting artists out there. So today I do have a new guest that some of you may be familiar with, but I met Lara in a very unexpected way. I was looking at a certain online creator's website and I saw Lara's testimonial. I found her background and her mission statement so intriguing and I wanted to get to know her a little bit better. So I thought, what better way than to invite her here to one of our live events? I'll let Lara, Lara share her background with you instead of me reading off her bio, which is fascinating. And then I have a few questions for her, but we're really here just to chat about being artists and entrepreneurs and, and to inspire all of you with just the path that other people have taken to become successful art or artists and make businesses out of it. So Lara has a very special gift at the end for everyone. She is gifting each and every one of you a digital download of each of her best-selling books. That's two, which I've heard are incredible and I can't wait to get them. So without further ado, I would love to introduce to you Lara Cornell. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and I always love to talk about, well, my journey, because all journeys are different, like you mentioned that, because I think all journeys are fascinating. Um, creativity, I think, yeah, I think everybody's born with creativity, but how they use it is always really interesting. So um, I was, uh, so I was raised in a creative environment. I was always um, crafty. I guess you could say. So I was in a family of artisans. So my grandfather was a woodworker. They were a family of farmers. So I also learned cooking and baking and all of those things. Slow food now is the trendy word for it. But yeah, right. <laughs> and all of those other things, uh, living off the land. Um, my father was super creative. Um, kind of had his hands in uh, architecture and stained glass and uh, everything. So does also some woodworking and some metalworking and all kinds of creative things. My mom, macrame and crochet, um, family of quilters and all of the things. So um, growing up where I did, it was um, kind of something you just did, right? You learned cross stitch, you learned all of those handicrafts and it was just kind of who you were. And as I got older, I just got, it was just something I went to as my go-to to keep your hands busy, right? And get creative. Um, but it wasn't really until I moved, I was a Rotary Exchange student uh, right after high school and I moved to Belgium um, in Europe. And that's when I really started to understand the, the, hand me down the tradition of the crafts because mm -hmm. that's when I started to see things that were centuries old the craftsmanships of things that were handed down um and where people would buy things or gift things or um pass down things that were 200 300 500 mm -hmm. 700 things years old you'd visit churches you know and look taking the details of all the stone masonry and uh the woodworking and the metal smithing and the castles that had the gilding which was one of my favorites i love gilding and, and the mosaics and the mosaics <laughs> yeah that you see all over morocco that i go to to visit those um that's when it really started to click with me like these tradition and these ancient craftsmanships um and I really started to take more of an interest in the arts. So, well, and yeah, go for no, it. No, it 
it, yeah. And it's really, you know, if you can be that young and get inspired that way. And I, you know, I have a sort of similar background that I went to Paris and finished my college degree there. To, I thought I was going to become a fashion designer and, you know, was designing clothes, couture, all that stuff. And it is in places like that, if you're fortunate enough to go, that you can, you know, learn so much and you're learning it by immersion. It's just being in that old country. But the word you use that's so important is craftsmanship. You know, there's such a big difference between crafts that we like to make here sometimes and what craftsmanship really is. Yeah. And so where did, so that's basically where it all started from. So how did it sort of segue after college into, I mean, we'll have a long path to today, but. <laughs> yeah. So my, so the first segue into it is, so, I mean, I did the stereotypical thing where I really wanted to go into the arts, but I was from many facets kind of steered away from it because it wasn't a viable career path. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I did, so I wanted to continue traveling. That was my big passion, no matter what facet I did that in. Um, so I went into teaching, which was a whole other story and teaching since I was five years old. So <laughs> <laughs> something I also love doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I went into teaching for a while and then i went into kind of the travel industry um but my segue back into the arts um was really because of burnout i was really getting burnt out on the path that i had taken um and was really craving that creative out i was craving that creative outlet because i had kind of let it all go you know i grew up with all of it and it was part of what i was always doing to um have that outlet and i had let it go off to the wayside. Yeah. Um, so I started picking it back up again. So taking classes and um, it was really my only outlet at the time besides, you know, motherhood is stressful, working mom, stressful, all of the things. Yes. Um, and I had never really, I had never intended in turning it into a business. Um, and this is kind of segues into other stuff, but I, um, what I had a good friend of mine that had followed her art path that I was um, grateful, incredibly grateful we had reconnected. So one of the good things about Facebook, we had reconnected through Facebook. Um, and she had encouraged me to start doing this huge art fair in um, Minneapolis that happens once a year that brings tens of thousands of people. Um, and she encouraged me to show my work. And that's how things started. And it went everything just went from there. And you, you said you have this big background of what you kind of came from, but what was the specific art that sort of drew you to show that at the fair? Um, I went into really painting was my biggest outlet at the time that I really loved doing. Um, I had not really any formal training in painting besides, I mean, I would argue that I had kind of created my own training, much like somebody would do with your programs, right? Mm -hmm. You find your own teachers. It's a little right. bit different than going to an art school where they provide the teachers. Right. right. When, I mean, I was in my um, mid thirties when I started doing this. So you do it a little bit differently. You seek out your teachers and you seek out your curriculum. Um mm -hmm. So I was taking a, a lot of <laughs> online classes, a lot. And that was way um, back. That's not like just in the last five years. We're talking. No, was, oh my gosh. It, now, yeah, now that I think about it, this was way back to over 10 years ago now that I was taking lots of different classes and I would do year long classes <laughs> with certain <teachers. clears throat> Um, and they became mentors and really, you know, a part of my, a, a part of my learning, a part of my career now mm -hmm. um really foundational people that really yeah really start well, for a catalyst to it yeah and it's such an interesting transition that you've had from the learning these different arts to what you're doing now and how did the books come in because you refer to your venture into the art business as like a patchwork quilt yeah well, how does how does it all come together so my art career. So like I said, I showed my artwork um, and without an intention really of starting it as a business. And that first show um, I brought in just over a thousand dollars 
which that's is fun. Insane. That's good. <laughs> With no intention of ever showing my work. And wow. The hardest thing I have ever done, one, the learning curve was super steep, right? Because I, how do you show your work? How do you price it? How do you make the little tags that, you know, you put next to your artwork? Mm -hmm. Um, how do you package them for people to take with them? All of the things. How do you make a business card? Um, and so once I had hit that learning curve and you hung everything up, which was, again, another learning curve, <laughs> and then people come and look at it and you're like, oh, I never actually <laughs> want to show it. <laughs> Uh, you're right. You're seeing in my soul now. That was good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was amazing because it was really my first critique, right? And it was to thousands of people. And the input was so amazing. And people had people crying in front of some of my work. Like it was really um, motivating, I guess is the best way to say it. And so um, it motivated me to start taking more chances. So right. there is no playbook how to move forward because there's so many different avenues you can take. Absolutely. So I was like, maybe I want to do more shows. So I would seek out ways to do that. And I thought maybe I want to be in boutiques. So I'd find boutiques that I wanted to be in and talk to them. And I would just kind of follow different threads and see what happened. If there was right. no plan. There was no anything. I would just follow different opportunities and see what happened. Um, the problem with that is I burnt out kind of fast. Mm -hmm. so I had mm -hmm. amazing response and, you know, on paper, amazing success. I had solo shows. I had, um, international shows. I had, mm -hmm. um, licensing agreements. I had, I was in boutiques around the country, like all the things. Um, but I was so burnt out. Plus I was working a full-time job. Plus I had kids and I just I couldn't do all the things. So I had to kind of pare it back. Um, and then I ended up opening um, a venue space. And that one started taking over all the things it started, it was a social impact space. Um, and it started winning lots of awards, and it started taking over my life <laughs> in all the good ways, but in all the time I didn't have. So it became more of a juggle. Um, right. That taught me is that one needed a business plan. Mm -hmm. That one. and what exactly would be considered a social impact space? What so exactly that was space, it? Which led to my books. Actually, mm -hmm. first book makers mark is all about really leaning into the impact in your business. So that space was dedicated very specifically to making impacts in the art spaces mm -hmm. um, and within the. Um, the nonprofit and charitable spaces. Mm -hmm. So the space existed to be a space that was low cost or no cost to people in the arts, organizations in the arts, nonprofit organizations, or um, charitable organizations. So in order to do that, I needed to figure out how to make money, right? So business plan. <laughs> um, so that space taught me the super, super, super hard way um, how to be a strategist and how to build strategy, um, how to make a social impact space work and how to really build a brand and impact driven brand. Um, that's what the first book, my Maker's Mark book is all about, is really artists are bleeding hearts, right? They really mm -hmm. want their work to mean something. Of course, they want people to be moved by their work, but they want to leave a legacy. They want their work to leave an impact beyond just the emotional impact, right? And right now, there's such a movement to big businesses and small businesses, but big businesses oh. trying to lean into the social, the social impact space and most of them doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. But as small business owners, micro business owners, solo business owners, however you want to call us as artisans, we have the opportunity to do it right because we're small enough that we can right. make a bigger impact and do it right. So that's what Maker's Mark is all about, how to build that strategy and how to build that business to be a really impact driven business.
And you were self-taught, shall we say, from kind of the get-go of that. It just was your passion and it kind of just fire. It just took off and you yeah. have, you know, the results are obviously the book and now you doing your strategy and coaching and things like that for other artists. So your knowledge, what you learned boots on the ground is now what you're able to share with people that may not have, you know, quite the same insight that you had to do it. Yeah. And then I did all the same thing I did when I started leaning into the arts, right? I sought out the teachers, the coaches, the mentors. I leaned into the the corporate businesses. What do they know? What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Um, and really analyzed where the opportunities are and how, how can it be done right? And where where the artist really sits in that because it's not, we're not the same, you know, as an artist, our, our brands are personal and their business. We're kind of a combination of the both. There's a lot of artisans that when they really go into branding or they go into their business, they really focus on the colors, the um, images, right? Um, and they tend to strip the personality out of their brand. And then they just look like everybody else, right? right? So you can't take the personality out of it. Really, to be a handmade business, you have to show up. There has to be, you have to have the personality in there. And it, in the end, if you're doing it right, it doesn't matter what your colors are. It's the wrong way to spend the money, right? You have to really show up. It doesn't mean you have to constantly be on Facebook. I know, it's that balance. Like that. <laughs> it is. It's but such a balance because there's so many other brands out now out now that are saying that they're handmade and they're not right so in order for the consumers to know who's a handmade who's an artist who's an artisan who really has that craftsmanship you can't just say it you have to show up in it and right. they want to support those especially if you're making an impact out there too so if you are um somebody who really wants to stand up for you know, making sure that all kids have meals at lunchtime, or if you're really standing up for um, uh, humane societies, you know, animal mm -hmm. uh, treatment, or if you're standing up for climate change or whatever the thing is, be that person, stand up for it, show up for right. it. That's what's really going to set you apart, not your brand colors. So. No. And how much in your coaching does the social media aspect play a part in it? Because it's almost like the behemoth meets the, you know, little guy and you, that little guy needs the social media, but how do you really, you know, say, Hey, get on Instagram, show yourself, but you know, really do. So I talk about, so I talk about your strategy as a tree and I think, a lot of times when people go into their marketing, so marketing is really your trunk and your leaves. It's the part that everybody sees. So when people really start out in their businesses, they go straight for the leaves, right? They want to make sure people see them. Mm -hmm. But they're, if a big storm comes along, which it always does, right? Something's going to happen. And if you haven't built a root system, your tree is going to blow right over. And then you're going to be like, what am I doing? I shouldn't be doing this. This is too hard. This isn't working. Maybe it works for a while, but there's it's not going to work for a long time. So I always say that you need to build your root system first. Your root system has to be solid. And that's who are you? What is your business even about? You have to be strong and firm in knowing what that is before you even go into working in your leaves. Um, for some artists, social media isn't necessary. It's just right. not. If, you're, if your focus is going into galleries, maybe your online social media or your Instagram is really just an online gallery page for galleries to find you, but it's not what you're going after. Um, if you're trying to sell online, different story. If right. you are really trying to get into boutiques, then your target's different. Um, if mm -hmm. you hate being on social media, don't do it. That's right. Yeah. Do it. So part of it too is really focusing on that impact because if you are, uh, let's say that your focus is on homelessness, that's really what you're all about. That's really what you're passionate about. You're going to 
shelters to help out every few months. If you're showing up in those places, you are the artist in those places. You're not an artist among artists among artists. On right. Social media. You're the artist that's helping out in these places. And then opportunities start coming to you. Right. Because you're the only one they know. And now they need a mural or they need cups or they need bowls, depending if you're a, cer a ceramicist or a potter. Or um, there's organizations that start showing up that also need connections for, excuse me, for blankets or whatever the case is, if you're uh, um, somebody who works in textiles. So showing just showing up on social media isn't looking for opportunities it's not helping you stand out necessarily so well, and if you don't know who you are then you're just one of a gazillion on social media it's so true if you don't have your mission statement and really you know who you are then it is a problem and i have like a kind of an interesting story in what exactly you're saying is I show, went to an event years ago, 15 years ago, for the Police Activities League, which are kids that are at-risk youth. And um, I met this you know, amazing guy and I was like, I need to volunteer. I need to like go see these kids. I need to make art with them. We need to make something. And long story short, I made um, a big sphere and then they mosaiced it and it was sold at the next event for two thousand dollars like before the auction even started it was kid art it was a big red you know play uh, ground ball that got turned into a concrete ball that became a mosaic two thousand dollars flipped to the thing over no one else could even try and purchase it and the family that bought it became one of my largest clients. They have nine pieces of my work and I am so invested and in still in that organization. But it's just because I showed up as an artist, someone that cared, someone that wanted to do something with my time that I hoped would make a difference. And, you know, and it has. And there's a big mural in a community arts workshop space that has the kids made. And so it's exactly you're it's exactly what you're saying. You know, you show up and it's not about saying, hey, hey, I'm here. It's just having that impact and really, you know, knowing how to um, put where your heart is and everything um, kind of follows, I think, after that. Yeah, it's building awareness. I mean, in the end, it's all about building awareness, but it's building right. awareness in a really different way that's much more authentic, does not feel salesy. It's no. really aligned with your values, with your heart, and it brings you to people that have similar values, similar hearts, um, and it just in a, a more authentic kind of way. It's more yeah, amazing. it is. And it was never an intention. I did not go to any of that with that intention. That was all just, you know, the universe working itself out. But my intention was wanting to help these kids mm -hmm. and continue to do so. So what had motivated you for focusing more heavily into the sustainability and the regeneration in the arts, which, you know, the picture that's been up that everyone's going to learn more about that we've been showing are those powdered pigments. Yeah. And in all mediums, including mosaic art, we like to tint things. So I want you to kind of talk a little bit about how this has become kind of your new path, not new, but your passion with the arts and the that sort of thing. Yeah. So sustainability. So it goes with impact, right? So a lot of it was thinking about what kind of impact I want to make. What is my legacy? Um, and part of the passion or what we talk about with our children is really taking care of the planet. You know, what can we do to be better? Um, and I was playing with um, earth pigments because I was trying to, you know, find a practice that connected. Part of it was finding a way that connected me a little bit more to the earth. Um, and part of it was trying to find a practice that was a little bit more sustainable. And in researching and digging a little bit more into it, I, I wanted to lean more heavily into it because, so the first, I was working mainly with acrylics, mainly at the time. This was just a two, three years ago, mainly acrylic painting. And, um, I loved the convenience of it, but what felt really disconnected from painting. It was too easy, too fast. You know, it just didn't, it, I, I wasn't the meditative, you know, when you're used to doing things like cross stitching and embroidery, that takes a long time, right? Quick and fast acrylic painting wasn't feeling the same to me. I wanted something that was taking more time, 
oil painting didn't love because of the um the fumes didn't love the cleaning up of it um and the more i researched acrylic painting i was getting really disenchanted with putting anything down the drain because it was all flowing into our watershed um acrylic paint is incredibly toxic for our waterways dry or wet not to mention it clogs our drain <laughs> our pipes <laughs> which is also terrible it's so hard. i cleaned into earth pigments um the problem with earth pigments um was i was mixing them with um acrylic binders which essentially was making my own acrylic, acrylic paint. paint same right. problem um so over the past couple of years i've really been leaning into how can i make paints that you can look you can wash down the drain and feel about them feel good about them going into the watershed or i could dump it out in my backyard and it had no effect on anything or i could put it in the compost and it didn't matter um so i've been playing more with you know make making my own pigments from botanicals making my own from the earth um and the ironic thing about it is it's bringing me back to <laughs> the old historic recipe <laughs> that lived centuries ago. So it's bringing me back to, you know, my memories of being in those old castles and those old churches and what they used to decorate the walls with the, the earth and the um, dyes and the, um, the tempera paints and things like that, which has really been fascinating and I've really enjoyed. Um, in doing so, what it has brought to mind is that art practices, so a lot of artists, most artists will say that nature inspires them in some way, shape or form, right? right? So whether it's, you know, the shape of the design or the colors they use or whatever the case is. Yeah. Um, but the, the problem still remains that what we create actually isn't usually good for the earth. So we're inspired by it. But what we create in most cases is not good for the planet. So I actually ended up going back to school and now doing a master's degree in sustainable design. Um, I was super inspired by uh, the Cradle the Cradle book by William McDonough um, with the idea of the circular. So a lot of people talk about the circular economy. I like to think of it as circular design. So are, can we create things that can be reused or repurposed or put back to the earth? So can we make something that can be reused or repurposed over and over and over again and never go to the landfill? Or can we design out the landfill from the very beginning and what we make? So by that theory or hypothesis or idea, um, an acrylic painting is never gonna be an option. Because acrylic paintings, they hardened to plastic. That was their purpose. They're meant to live that way, which means in the end, eventually, it's a landfill product, right? So that's something that I'm trying to figure out, come to terms with, <laughs> decide what to do with. But it's where the pigments come in, right? So if I can reduce the color to pigment, what can I do with that pigment? What can I bind it with? What can I mix it with? What can I create with it? to make a piece of art that could eventually go back to the plant, go back to the earth. Right. Well, and yeah. You, know. and you, you and I talked a little bit earlier this week about, you know, as saying, as mosaic artists, we do use pigments in our, you know, concrete products, whether it's grout or the mortar and, you know, the color steadfastness is something that would have to be experimented with to see if it could last, especially in some kind of exterior, um, you know, environment, but not, it's so worth it to at least experiment and see what they could do. So you will be sending me some pigments or showing me how soon I know. Um, and I'm happy to report back to everybody about how it goes. But we have a really interesting thing here at the property, um, at, you know, Mosaic Arts Online Headquarters, is um, we have a, a cactus that's called the Nopalis, and it grows um, a fruit that's called a, a black, what's it called, Jerry? Oh, um, Not blackberry, I'm losing my word. Yeah. Prickly pear. Yes. It's a prickly pear. And the prickly pear, you know, is a very, very vibrant, like uh, magenta color. Well, there's also a bug that can get onto this plant and it is the same color as the prickly pear and it's called a cochineal. 
Yeah. And if you scrape off the cochineal like into a jar and you take hot water, you have the most vibrant magenta. You could tie dye, you could paint, you could water. I mean, it was, it's, unfortunately the plant's doing better now so we don't have as much cochineal but um but it's it goes back to what you're saying you know i live in a place that had native americans here long before me and they were making pigments all day long like indigo yep. all of it yep. so you know it's not that far away that it can't yep. be brought back um and we just have to get out of the Amazon brain of like, give it to me now, make it fast, make it here yeah. and um, find that I, I love, I think, you know, I think COVID had that part of it going well for itself, which was the homesteading, which was the, I'm on my earth, I'm on my land. What can I do, you know, for staying home that could be, you know, beneficial. And like, you know, you and I were talking earlier, you know, we could talk a little bit about what's behind you because I just am so fascinated with it. But you can't see, I, at least in my view, maybe more people can see above Laura's head. But I said to her in our rehearsal this week, I said, your wallpaper is oh, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that, folks, is not wallpaper. That is hand painted mural on her wall that was her covid project, which is absolutely <laughs> stunning and so beautiful. And was it done with pigments that you made? It wasn't because I hadn't really gotten into right. that. It was um, uh, wall paints. So, yeah. but I have, we, we redid our bathrooms out of necessity. We live in a house that's um, 100 years old. So, it's a radiator behind you, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's no, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So, I have walls. I've been tormented in my sleep about what I'm going to do with it because I just can't bring myself to use. Um, any of the paints in the stores, because even though they're water-based, so water-based means that there's, of course, there's there's water in there, but it's still an acrylic binder. Um, still are not supposed to wash it down your drains. It still goes into the watershed, still affects plants. Um, there's a new study that I found um, in my research for my graduate degree out of, um, I forget, I can't remember if it's Norway, one of the Scandinavian countries, um, that proposes that the acrylic paint from house paints, um, uh, paints from um, industry, so industry paints, um, arguably from artists and like all the acrylic paints around the world um, have are 10 times worse than uh, textiles in the waterways right now. So wow. I, I just I can't in good conscience use any paints so i'm trying to figure out <laughs> what i can do with these walls and it's keeping me up at night um so i'm still figuring that out i don't it'll be something i'll figure it out but yeah so trying to figure out how how can i make a studio that is not reliant at all on any petroleum products um and it's like i said ironically bringing me back to ancient practices right and traditional practices not all of them good some of them using toxic, um, toxic uh, metals and things like that that you should not be using in your studio. Um, so, but still giving you ideas and, and clues into what's possible and what you could be doing. So somebody had asked too about the, the longevity of pigments. Right. So, um, earth pigments tend to last longer. They tend to keep their color. One thing to think about with earth pigments, if you're doing it yourself and you're foraging and you're finding something from the earth, um, there's ethical foraging. You can look into that. That's too long of a thing to get into today. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you want to keep in mind is when you're taking earth, you're still taking earth. It's not something that's going to replenish itself. So that's one thing that you want to think about. I've been playing more specifically with botanicals because it's something that can be regenerative. It can be something that um, that replenishes itself. It does tend to be more fugitive. So part of the question that I've been asking myself and thinking about is, is that a bad thing? Right. Right. Is is a painting or something that doesn't even have to be a painting. It's something that creating or dying. Um, if it fades over time is that a bad thing? So I think part of this whole sustainability and regenerative kind of is a big mindset shift. 
too, mm -hmm. right? So, well, permanence, permanence art is, or non-permanence art has become a huge conversation. Um, I can't remember the for morning altars. I don't know if you follow him. I think it's morning altars. He makes some of the most beautiful like floral mandalas, but yeah. nothing's. Oh yeah. Yeah. Down. Yep. Nothing is forever and it is, it is breathtaking. So I think there is a mindset that, you know, if you're going to get into, you know, no, it may not last 1800 years hang, you know, in a museum, but the piece that you had, not the piece, the picture you sent me, that was the one that had the yellow flowers. And then you were trying to testing the different um, hues or values of it. Um, is that just watercolor? Are you just adding water, crushing it? Like, can you give us a little background on how yeah. the process goes from flower to paper? Yeah. So that one was um, a Dyer's chamomile. So to make, I had made ink on it. So I added a little bit of vinegar um, and that was it. A little bit of vinegar, maybe a little bit of salt. Um, and then to change the value, I added baking soda. Um, I added uh, citric acid, so like a lemon. Um, I added, I'm trying to remember all the things I added to it, uh, like a bicarbonate. Um, soap one of them was a soap um one was ash i can't remember but they're things that you would find like in your kitchen right and so do you value and do you know being in much more entrenched in this topic and everything are there people that are trying to monetize this and make businesses market this type of um pigments yeah. like this yeah. So, um, depending on what you're using, it can, so you can use it for dyeing, obviously botanical dyeing. That's a big, becoming a bigger industry right now, both in fashion and then more in homesteading and in art. Right. Um, there's also, um, uh, there's a couple different companies that'll make inks out of botanicals and, and earth and, uh, or not earth botanicals and, um, forged objects. Um, there's also, uh, there's several, art, several companies that make watercolors, um, right. called handmade watercolors. You have to be careful though. Some are, some are made from synthetics, synthetic pigments. Usually if there are lots of, if it's the standard rainbow of colors and then metallics and things like that, those are usually uh, synthetic pigments. Um, some are earth pigments. Um, there is a whole um, community of wild pigment foragers that will make pigments. Some of them don't sell them. Some of them just create them for their own artwork and then right. they sell their artwork. So yeah, you can find them. You have to dig a little bit more and then you'll find a community once you, once you have dug a little bit. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Like, so what are you, what are you working on right now in your art practice? Right now it's really, um, the material itself is what mm -hmm. I'm taking to do. So um, I'll make like little, I'll make sketches and then use them, use the inks to fill in. I'm playing more with watercolors and well, more with the ink and then making them into pigments and then kind of seeing what lasts, what doesn't last, what colors I get. Because even if you, uh, you know, get a big, bright, beautiful, deep red ink and then you make it into a pigment, your pigment might be a totally different color. Mm -hmm. so it's right now I'm playing with the materials and seeing what it comes with. And I'm working on partnering with regenerative farms to source my materials. So really making it full circle. Do you sleep at all? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, here and there. So, so now that we've kind of gone through all of that, how does this transition to you working with these artists and clients and having your yeah. guild and your academy? Because that's a whole other don't sleep at night thing. I mean, that's amazing. The eighth day of the week we don't have yet. Right. Um, well, so for starters, the guild is really um, just starting to take off. It's I've been softly kind of launching it and playing with it. It's going. It's part of my thesis work through my graduate school. So it's kind of forming as my work has been forming. Um, that started because I had, I have clients. So my clients are all kinds of artisans. There's 
painters, there's metalsmiths, there's woodworkers, there's ceramicists. So essentially anything that anybody that hand makes something, right, that um, is connected to their work that in a way, I don't know how to, like in a tangible way is the best way to mm -hmm. say it. That usually has some kind of product. Um, I have, I had a client that was a metalsmith. And she was really leaning, she wanted to really lean into the sustainability piece because that's part of what we talk about in the academy with my clients. It's not a huge focus, but it is something that we talk about. And she really wanted to lean into more sustainable practices in her studio and in metalsmithing. And she was asking me about different materials that she could use. And unfortunately, that is a skill set that I do not have. So I didn't have answers to those questions. And so as we talked more, the discussion was, wouldn't it be great if we had a community of all different kinds of artisans where you could kick around these questions, right? And it, we discovered too, the more we talked that sometimes to the answers to these sustainability questions would come from a different artisan, you know, yeah. maybe the answer comes from a woodworker that tried something that you could use in your metalsmithing studio. It's not always the same industry. So right. I was learning, right? Like the answers sometimes to my pigment questions would come from some uh, somebody in the dyeing community, not necessarily somebody in the earth pigment community or not necessarily somebody that was working um, in watercolors. So it's worth having a community of all different kinds of artisans that are kind of going towards the same goals yeah, and are willing to share information or you try different things. So that's what the purpose of the Sustainable Artisan Guild is, is to have that community where people can share resources and ask questions. Um, and then the academy is really where I help clients build their strategy, build their root systems, really lean into what is your impact? Who are you? What is your business all about? Let's make that into something. Where are you going to start? So we build all the all the industry keywords, right? Your marketing strategy, your communication strategy, all of those things, but really formed around who you are as an artisan, really focused on impact, um, a little bit of sustainability and the artisan specifically. Um, and then uh, the residency is something that I've played with, also coming out of my thesis project we played with this year, because I had people that would finish with the academy and then they would say, oh, maybe I should really think what I'm making, much like I did. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Maybe I should think what I'm making. Mm -hmm. um, so the residency was kind of born. It's an opportunity to really dive more into the sustainability piece and what I coined slow design, which is my second, the focus of my second book, The Sustainable Maker, is really kind of pay, going all the way back to the drawing board with what you make and looking at your supply chain, looking at your design process, looking at your beginning product, your end product, and is it really aligned with your sustainable and regenerative goals? Um, is it something that you can go to market with? Who's looking for it? Um, there's a huge industry right now for people that want sustainable, regenerative products. But if your product isn't one of those things, <laughs> then, you know, then you don't really stand a chance coming in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Right, right, um, right. And so if someone wanted to find out more about these different programs of what you're doing between the coaching, the academy, how, how would they do that? And what sort of is the path that they would be on? So everybody starts, um, well, the Sustainable Artisan Guild is for anybody. For anybody. That's the community. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Space. Um, if they wanted to, I always talk with people first where they're at. So it kind of depends on where they're at in their journey. Journey. Most people start in the Artisan Academy and mm -hmm. really now because it's really, I feel like it's really important to know who, who you are and what your business is all about before you lean into the next step. Right, right. And is it a, is it a, is it a year long? Is it based on, is it a program that you like have a drip system regimented or is it just coach with where they're at and then take them to their next step? It's more of a drip system. They always, mm -hmm. everybody always starts at the same place. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, and it's a year long. 
No, that's only eight weeks. Oh, oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So they can go to your website to see more about that. Yep. Or they're welcome um, to email you too. Yeah. Okay, great. So we'll have all that information in the chat. And does anyone have any questions for Laura? I know a couple of people have asked and we've seen them coming along, but now's a great time. Um, if anyone has um, any questions to pop them in the chat and we'll get to them. But how would they get these free eBooks that you are so generously gifting to our community? Cause I can't. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. So the eBooks, you can just send me an email. It's Lara at laracornell.com. And just tell me that you saw me here or heard me here and you would like the books and I'll send them over to you. Okay, great. And Jerry, I'll put that in the chat as well. And how, I just have to ask being a digital marketing person, how did you get Seth to be your um, forward on the, on the book? That's a big, big nod. I awesome. know. Uh, so I was in a marketing conference um, and one of the speakers in one of the sessions I went to was Seth Godin. And he was talking about, uh, at the very end, he talked about this book that he um, uh, was a part of called the Carbon Almanac, which mm -hmm. talks about climate change. Right. Um, and when I was writing The Sustainable Maker, uh, that was kind of in the back of my mind because they're very, there's, they're, The Sustainable Maker is all about entrepreneurship. It's about artists. It's about really um, taking care of the earth. So I reached out to him. I just reached out to him. And I said, um, I wrote this book. I was inspired by your talk, which it was. That was part of the catalyst for writing the book because it had been in the back of my mind. And I thought, yeah, this is the time to write that book. So I said, uh, I was at this conference. I was inspired by your work with um, the Carbon Almanac. And I would really love it if you would be an advanced reader for my book. And he said, sure. Wow. That's great. That that's it's for those of you who don't know, Seth Godin is one of the biggest digital marketing um, names out there. And uh, that's, that's just a great thing to put for more marketing on your book. And I'm, that was really exciting when I saw that for you. Um, but yeah, no, Laura, this has been so awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. If, if anyone doesn't have any questions, is there anything else that you wanted to add? today oh there was one mention about um inorganic pigments and K yeah that'd be my husband the chemist <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah so yes earth pigments things like that for sure can last a long time and yes cave paintings are some of the earliest versions of that um pigments made from flowers like for example pigments made from grass um mm -hmm. the color comes from chlorophyll um and those will last not long uh maybe a couple days they fade super super fast so things from botanicals don't tend to last long but the earth pigments i mean you look at rock formations right some beautiful rock badlands things like that those those will be around a long time um because earth is used in paints that i mean that's, right yeah right things so yes earth yeah paint. And there's a place in death valley we go out to death valley a lot and there's a place called artist palette and it is truly a palette of this geological kind of like one mass, but it changes from purple to green to brown to white. Like it's unbelievable wow. what you see. And, you know, you're not supposed to take anything from Death Valley, but if you just happen to chisel off a little bit. But um, no, the thing that's interesting, my background before full time doing this now was I was a costumer for movies and television. Mm -hmm. And we used tea all the time yeah. to um, what we called knock down a white. So nobody ever wears white on television. If you're ever watching something and some man's wearing a white dress shirt, it's not white. It has been knocked down just a little bit and it's called tea dye because you can't have bright white on television because the lights will just bounce right off of it. So, you know, there's been this, there, I think it's there in places that um, people might not even realize in life right now. It just needs more of you out there to say, hey, this is possible and, um, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, awesome. Well, 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone for coming and put your, uh, if you, Jerry, did you put the email in for everyone to, to reach out to Laura to get their books? I'm not sure I have that. Laura at lauracornell.com. It's L-A-R-A at L-A-R-A-C-O-R-N-E-L-L.com. Yep. Perfect. And, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a great hour to just hang out and chat. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, if you want to learn more about Laura, that's her website as well. It's just Laura Cornell or that is your website too. Yep. Great. Yep. It's a beautiful website. Lots of great stuff on it. So thank you. Thank you for being here. It's been great. And uh, we'll see you guys all again soon. Thank you. Yeah.